Hey, it's your old pal Tim here, and just getting off watch, and uh, it's a pretty gloomy day, so I figured, what better time than to talk about safety than right now? So let's get on it. Agora nós temos legendas também em português. Vi har nu undertext på svenska. Klicka på sluten bildtext och väl svenska. Voor Nederlandse ondertiteling klik op de drie puntjes bovenin, dan op ondertiteling en vervolgens op Nederlands. Vi har undertexter på norsk. Hola, ¿cómo están? Bienvenidos al canal de Team Baxea, ahora con sus títulos en español. So this is going to be the second in our series of on safety. And uh, this is going to be more of a conceptual thing. And once again, it has less to do with the professional side, meaning all of us that are in the commercial world have a series of tests that we have to do and drills and log entries and all that sort of thing that we have to do and everybody on this end usually knows that um, they're checked about it all the time so this is really for the uh, recreational boater maybe you can uh, pick up some things that we do that maybe you can do too all right so let's get at it the first thing I want to talk about is your log book oops my camera's falling let's try this again all right maybe, maybe that'll hold a little better all right so so let's talk about the logbook. And uh, I'm not going to tell you how to fill out a logbook or anything like that. You guys do whatever you want. But what you should do is you should have a page either in the front or in the back somewhere that you can easily access. And when I say the front, I don't mean like the first page. I mean literally the front. You might want to log all the dates, all the expiration dates of items that expire on your boat. For instance, you might want to log when your life raft expires, when the hydrostatic release expires. You might want to um, do the same thing for your EPIRB and your EPIRB registration and your EPIRB battery uh, dates. You might want to log dates for things like uh, lights in your, for flashlights on your PFDs, um, obviously all your flares and that sort of stuff. Anything that has a, that's time sensitive, you should really put on your logbook where you can easily look at it. And then for people that are in the recreational world and boat seasonally, every season when you open it up, you can look down and see anything that's going to expire that you know in that month or in that season you can highlight and uh, know that you have so much time to replace that and uh, so that's kind of a good good thing nice easy thing to do the next thing I want to talk to you about are checklists now um, I've mentioned before in other videos that we have a lot of uh, a lot of the stuff we do comes from the airline industry because those guys are really good about safety and they have a number of checklists and so do we and uh, so should you <laughs> There's a couple checklists. You don't actually need a checklist that you go and check off, but it's good if you write a checklist down and you start doing, every time you go there, you start doing certain things on your checklist. And as you become more and more familiar with it, you won't have to go and look at the list. You'll know that when I get on the boat, these are the things that I do. And I just wrote down a couple of things. You're going to have to figure this out on your own boat, how it pertains to you, whether you're a power boat or whether you're a sailboat, whether you're a center console or a great big motor yacht. You're going to have to figure that out on your own. But uh, some of the checklists you might have, you know, obviously there's an that there's an engine checklist, and uh, you know, before you before you get going, when you get on the boat, you really should check the oil. And uh, some people pull out the dipstick and look at it. That doesn't do anything. 
<laughs> well, it does something, but you really should wipe the dipstick, put it back, and then take a fresh reading on it. A lot of people have been messed up because of that one mistake. Oh, my camera keeps... it's not holding a suction here, so let me try this again. All right, so, so yeah, you want to uh, check the oil in the engine, check the oil in your reduction gear. Um, some people call that a gearbox or a reverse gear. You want to check those things. You want to check the coolant level, maybe tension on the belt, and uh, all of your manuals should tell you what is acceptable for all of that. Uh, you also want to do it, that's a good time while you're in there checking around. And when I say this, you're not spending a half an hour. You can do this stuff really quickly. But do a visual inspection. Does everything look right? Is there nothing dripping? Is there nothing? And the cleaner you keep your engine, the easier it is to spot problems long before they become issues. So many people have commented that our engine rooms are really clean. We don't do that just because we're neat freaks. We do that so that we can spot little teeny problems. If the engine's covered in oil and you start having and developing an oil leak, you're never going to know if it just started now or ages ago. So that's what we do. And then obviously you want to go and check your sea strainer and your seacock if you have one of those too. And there's another, these aren't the only things. These are just a, a guideline that I just threw together for you for check, checking. Another thing that you might want to do before you, before you think about leaving the dock is uh, power up your electronics. You should have all of your electronics that you're going to use or even that you might potentially use. Like for example, it might be a sunny day, it doesn't hurt to power up the radar. A lot of the old radars have a warm-up period and so start up, start up, let the the MFD, the multifunction display, go up through its startup sequences, do all that sort of stuff. And while you're doing that, make sure that where you're planning on going, if you're going to a thing, if you're going to a specific place, put all that stuff in your in your chart plotter long before you leave the dock. You see some people going up the channel and they're all over the place and it turns out they have their head in their chart plotter trying to figure out where their waypoints are ten miles down the road. So get all that stuff done long before you get going. Um, obviously a bilge check is always a good idea. Uh, just because you have an automatic bilge pump doesn't really uh, mean anything. It could have died, you don't know. Uh, even if you have a, a bilge alarm, never hurts to lift up a deck plate, take a look in there. And it's also a visual reminder so that in the event that you uh, start taking on water, you'll know you'll know visually because you looked at it yourself how much water was in there when you started before you left the dock uh, you want to make sure everything's stowed down below um, if you have a if it's a center console it's not so much of a big issue but you don't want pole you know fishing poles and everything rattling around and everything because you'll see a lot of people headed up the channel and they're doing they're doing basically house cleaning that they should have done long before they left the dock and incidentally i should stop for a second how many people how many times have we all seen the guy who gets in the dinghy either you know maybe off of his boat on a mooring gets in there unties the dinghy and goes to start the start the outboard and it doesn't start i don't know why people do this but man you should never i I don't know, it's, not, it's probably not a life and death thing, but it makes so much easier. Start, never undo a line from a secure place until you have a means of transportation that you can trust. So get that engine running before you let that go. All right, let's see, what else? Uh, on the deck, you want to make sure that your lines are put away and tidy, uh, you know, as much as you can before you're going to do that once you take in the rest of your lines as well. But if you have loose li stuff lying around, um, when they say ship shape in Bristol fashion, they're not just talking about a showboat. We're really trying to reduce tripping hazards and getting tangled up and that sort of thing. It's a good time to, uh, when you're walking around the deck before you leave, that you also keep an eye and look for anything that seems to be out of place or something that's not tied down or stowed right it's a good time to check the anchor too the anchor might be your last means of saving you if you have an engine failure you can drop the anchor and uh, hopefully uh, get yourself before the bottom gets you so make sure all that's ready to go some people have anchors and you see them almost rusted in place and they haven't moved in 10 years because they always pick up a mooring yeah that's good until they need it and when they need it they're gonna need it pretty quickly that's usually the way so I'm not saying that you deploy the anchor or anything like that just make sure everything's freed up ready to go and you're, you're all set to go 
all of this seems like a lot to do. It's really not once you start getting in the habit. I mean, you can probably do everything I just mentioned there with less than in less than five minutes, including your engine check starting up. By the t you know, you can turn on your electronics and run around the deck while you're doing that. While you get back, the electronics should be up and going. Maybe after your engine check, you've already started your engine, allowing it to come up to temperature, and. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows this, but it's always a good idea to make sure if you have a wet exhaust that you're seeing water coming out of the exhaust, but everybody probably knows that. And then, uh, uh, you know, uh, you don't, if you've gone and you've checked all this stuff, just make sure that you're, you have access, you remember where the flares are, where your EPIRB is, where your PFDs are, where your med kit is, that sort of thing. So anyway, like I say, you don't need to, you don't need a, a if you can't remember all that, make a checklist until you have it in your head, but you really should have a routine before, before you get going, before you do anything, and maybe the last thing, once everything, the engine's warming up, the, you've got the electronics going, everything's set, and you have somebody on the boat, maybe that's a good time to sit down and have a little safety meeting with them. And I say a little safety meeting, it can be very little. It can be little, you know, just, just a few minutes and talk about the different things that you're going to do. Now then, this brings us to the next thing, and that's that I said in, my other, in the first safety meeting how it's important to write things down. Um, I'm not, as I said in the other video, I'm not somebody that takes notes, but I do believe that you know, somebody in the comments was talking about muscle memory, but with using your brain, that if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, it gets imprinted in, in, in your brain. Anyway, it's a good idea to almost have, I'm going to talk about these, these different plans that you should have. All of the plans put together, you might call an ops manual or operations manual like we have on in the commercial. In the commercial end, we have an operation manual that will tell you step by step how to do everything the way the company wants it done. Well, in this case, you're your company. You should have one of these manuals, and the manufacturer of your boat probably won't make one because they don't know what how you're going to use the particular boat or how, what, you know, all the... Anyway, so let's just go go over a thing. You should have a dewatering plan. And a dewatering plan just means for one reason or another, you're getting water in the boat and you need to get it out and your means of getting it out is either broken or it's not... Uh, you, you, it's coming in faster than you can get it out. So you need to have a plan for that. That doesn't mean that you need to, to install massive fire pumps or anything like that. You just need to think through that scenario. You know, maybe this is a good time to stop and talk about how search and rescue people's time is usually filled up, not always, but the vast majority of their time is filled up rescuing non-commercial people. And it's not because they're less safe, it's because they don't go through all the checklists and the plans and do everything that we have to do and we have to keep checking it and that, you know, uh, my mate has things that I have to check him on and then my boss checks me. We even have internal auditors that check all of my paperwork to make sure everything's getting done on time. Anyway, you don't have to have all that. But you should have a plan, a dewatering plan. So what are you going to do if you have a, a rule 5,000 or whatever and, and for some reason it stops working and you've got water coming in? You better have another idea of what you're going to do. Um, maybe that's, maybe it's, it's buckets if you're in a boat that you can bucket out. Maybe it's a hand pump, maybe it's an emergency pump, whatever it is, that's fine, but just think about that. Have a plan, write down, if we are in this situation, this is what we do. And then uh, another, another plan that you might have that has to do with dewatering is that if you can't do it, maybe you head for a shoal. Maybe you try to put, it on, put the boat on the beach. Remember, as, as much as we don't want to touch bottom, it's better to touch bottom in three feet of water than it is more than your freeboard because that would be a re that would be a, even a worse day but anyway you get the idea of a dewatering plan another plan that you might want to write down and figure out what are you going to do if you have a fire some people will say well i have a halon system well, i'm kind of dating myself there aren't any halon well the halon systems have all timed out but maybe you have an automatic fire suppression system like a co2 bottle that when it hits a certain temperature dumps into the engine room Maybe you have on um, so, um, one of the boats that I'm looking at has a uh, has a little 
cover over the engine room, uh, over a hole in the engine room that's just big enough so you can lift the cover up and stick your fire extinguisher in and fill the, the whole engine room with CO2. Whatever it is, think about what the, the fire, you know, where your potentials are. When we talk about our fire plans, we look at historically where tugboats catch on fire the most, and that's where we try to make sure that we have the most current plan. For an example, uh, there's been off of Rhode Island years ago, there was a tugboat that uh, sank and ended up having a huge oil spill because it went up on one of Rhode Island's beautiful beaches only because the dryer vent, lint in the dryer, had caught on fire. Anyway, have a fire plan. What are you going to do? How are you going to, you know, what, what are you doing to mitigate the possibilities of having a fire? And if you have a fire, how are you going to fight it? And at what point are you going to call it quits and get out of there? Uh, sometimes people go, we smell smoke, and uh, they just, well, I don't see any fire, so let's just keep going. We'll keep hooking it up till we get to the dock. Maybe you should have a plan. Have a plan with a couple things, write it down. And once you get it written down, the good news too is that if you have somebody that's new on the boat, you can go over the plan with them. And going over the plan with them really is what, that's good for them, but it's a lot better for you too. After you've written this stuff down and you go over the plan, it sinks in your head so much better. Uh, let's see. You might want to plan for an onboard a medical emergency. What happens if you or somebody on the crew breaks an ankle, breaks an arm, gets hit by the boom, maybe slips, maybe if you're fishing on a center console and you get a, and somebody's casting and they get the uh, proverbial hook in the eye or whatever, you know, it's awful to think about, but these things happen every day. I don't, I'm not going to tell you how to prevent getting a hook in your eye or that sort of thing. You guys can figure that out on your own. What I am going to tell you is it's a good idea to have a, a, a plan that is written down. When we have a medical emergency, it maybe it's a heart attack, maybe it's chest pains, maybe it's, it's any, anything. Maybe It could be an allergic reaction. What do you do? You open up the plan and it will say something like, the first thing you need to do is call 16. And call on 16, call the Coast Guard, let them know that you're having an emergency, and then you might want to put the procedures of what you're going to do when you do call on 16. Who you are, the description of your vessel, your location, how many people on board, what the nature of the emergency, that sort of thing. Um, there, part, part, of, part of your on your onboard medical emergency plan might also be almost triage. Is this something that we need to head for the dock for or is this something that we can deal with right now? You might have something as simple as uh, dealing with seasickness. If you're out with four people and one of them is deathly seasick, it does, the, the, the other three people don't enjoy themselves either. So you might want to just have these things. Say, so just write it down, have a plan, it's in your operations manual. And um, I know it sounds silly, you might say, well, I only have a 22 foot center console. You don't have to, you know, you're going to have to trim all these ideas and plans to your own boat. Everything you do will just help you a little bit more to prevent something. And if you do a lot of them, that little bit becomes much bigger. And you're never going to be free of having an emergency. Things happen, that's, that's the nature of it. But the more, you know, what do they say? Luck favors the prepared. So, so try to be more prepared. All right, let's keep going down. Uh, abandoned ship plan. Now we had an abandoned ship video. That was the first one. You might want to talk about whether you have a life raft or you don't have a life raft. If you don't have a life raft, what are the things that you do in that? And, and like I say, write these things down, even though in that emergency, you're not going to open the book, but by writing them down and having it the same and going over it at least once a season, hopefully once a month, and maybe even more than that. That's up to you. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. You, you figure that out on your own. But if you don't have a life raft, abandoned ship doesn't mean just jump in the water. Maybe it should talk about that you send out a mayday. Maybe it's talking about uh, activating an EPIRB if you have one. Or uh, maybe if you're in cell phone range, call 911. As simple as that sounds, any of these things should are things that will help you and they should be part of your plan. Man overboard scenario, uh, you know, should have a plan for if you lose somebody overboard. And that, that you know, 
in an outboard if you have an outboard you might want to talk about uh, on your plan how you're going to bring somebody back over the side when we're anchored up with an outboard a lot of people come in over the transom you don't want to do that if you're out to sea and your engines running because you don't want to risk them getting even if they don't get mangled by the propeller the action of the boat versus them and a hard hard surface of an outboard they can get all beat up there so you might want to think about how you're going to retrieve somebody over the head, you know over the side if you're sailing and somebody goes overboard and your sails are out that's one scenario if you're sa on a sailboat and you're motoring that's another scenario those are different things that you might want to do it and like I say I, I'm not going to design the plan for it you guys are the master of your own boats. You need to do this. You need to figure out the, your own plan of what you're going to do in each one of these scenarios. Write it down and use it over and over again and share it with the rest of your crew. You might want to have a, a plan for what happens if you uh, foul your prop. You know, you get a up north we get lobster pots in our wheels up down south they get crab pots in the wheel could be something as simple as a, a trash bag um, I even hear out west people follow their wheels with great big giant kelp that hasn't been an issue in my life but apparently I don't I'm not on the west coast but anyway so if if you're on a boat and it has a propeller whoops they're doing a job now so things are shaking and my uh, I don't have a really good surface here to mount my suction cup mounts. That's why I have to keep keep readjusting this while we're working. But uh, yeah, so so if you if you have a boat, even if you have a full keel and a protected and a pr protected propeller, you might want to think about what you're going to do. How are you going to handle a foul prop? Uh, some people say, well, I have line cutters. Line cutters will help you, but they don't. They don't take the line out. You still might have a problem. You you might the line cutter might cut the line, and then before you know it, the the piece of the line that line cutter didn't get goes and works its way up and gets, does even more damage. Anyway, that's something you're gonna have to work out. But uh, it's a good idea to have a plan. What happens if you foul your prop? Uh, how about a plan for an unintentional grounding? Nobody wants to plan on an unintentional grounding, but oddly enough, they do happen. So, in your boat, depending on whether you're a full keel, you know, a fin keel or a full keel, or whether you're an outboard or an outdrive or an inboard, all these things make a difference of how you're going to deal with that. But I really in encourage you to think about how you are going to react, what you're going to tell your crew, what your plan is with the way the wind and the tide is going, that when you in land on, on a shore and uh, you're, you're hitting bottom, how you're going to get off of that, or what steps are you going to take that you might only have a very small window of opportunity to make refloating the boat or getting it off of the shoal so much easier. There's so many people that have been high and dry and they said, man, if I had just turned the wheel this way and gave it a shot this way, the boat would have leaned this way and it would have come off so much easier. Those are all things that you might want to think about on a, a plan for unintentional grounding. Um, then obviously, uh, you know, this applies to everybody. You should have part of your plan should be about for an engine failure. You know, uh, mechanical things break. That's why engineers are in business. Anyway, uh, what are you going to do when you lose an engine? Some people say, well, I can use the dinghy. Some people say, well, I'm a sailboat. It doesn't matter. The problem is when you need the engine, you're probably not sailing. Like when you're coming into a, a confined space like a, 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 a mooring field or a harbor or a tight channel. So plan on what, you, what steps you're going to take if you have an engine failure. And then one of the last things is kind of silly, but it's, it's something that we all have to do on our side, and they call it a, a VSP, a Vessel Security Plan. This is something that's mandated by the IMO, and uh, we all have to do this. It's probably not that big a deal with you guys. You guys hopefully aren't going to be in waters that you have to worry about piracy. But you should still have a section of your operation manual, of, when I say the operation manual, this folder that will have all of these plans that hopefully you've put together. And somewhere in there you should talk about, this is how we secure the boat. I lock this and I remember to shut this hatch. I remember to lock this from the inside and I have the key over here and I have a spare over there. Then you might also want to say, um, 
when we go to a harbor and we go somewhere and we want to leave the the port, the, you know, the the ports open so that the wind goes through the boat and all that. You might want to think about who can get through what hatch. A lot of places up here in the northeast are relatively safe. Boats don't get broken into as much around here as they do in other places in the world. Nevertheless, security, not so much with pirates like I was saying, but, but securing the boat. You've spent probably, you know, from tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars on having the uh, having a, a boat. It, it just makes sense to spend a few minutes putting together how you're going to secure it. And part of security is, you know, part of the plan is going to be when you leave it, whether you're leaving it at a marina, where, how do you lock it up? And in that, you might want to also talk about when you lock things up, are you going to leave your seacocks open or are you going to leave them off? If you walk down most marinas in, hot, in warm weather places, you'll see a lot of boats that are locked up and they all have water coming out the side because they left their air conditioning on because they don't want the boat to get mildewed. Now whether you do that or not, that's up to you. I'm just saying that if you leave a couple hundred thousand or maybe even a million dollar boat with water that is being pumped into the boat and hopefully pumped out and everything is locked, if the boat starts to sink, maybe the guy in the marina says, oh, your boat's starting to sink. And if you're not there, they can't even get in to, to shut the seacock. So think about that. Oh, and another one too, the marina that I, I was a part of, I don't know, 20 years ago or so, um, they had a couple boats that actually sank because of the fresh water line. People would hook up to the, to the dock so that they wouldn't use the water in their tanks and the, it would charge the whole system. A lot of boats are set up that way so that they can continue to use the water. Well, sometimes when they'd leave, a lot of the boats are using the, the you know, fittings, whether it be a hose clamp that pops off or the shark bite fittings or whatever. One of those hoses pops off. You can literally sink your boat with fresh water coming in off the dock. And I witnessed that on boats at the marina that I was at before. So these are all part of the things that you want to talk about in a vessel security plan. It doesn't have to just be about pirates and what happens if bad guys come along. Sometimes we are our own biggest bad guy. Anyway, that was it. I hope you guys found that useful. And I hope that uh, you guys continue to stay, stay safe and hope that you like this safety series. I'm sorry I'm not out on deck. It's na a nasty day out. And uh, Anyway, that's that. If, uh, if you did like this video and you haven't seen them first, go back. And after I put a couple of these up, I'll, I'll make a, uh, a playlist of safety videos that you can click on. But make sure you do, that, do these things. Stay safe out there. And uh, if we talk about anything, we should keep remembering that luck favors the prepared. All right. I'm Tim. This is Tim B. And I'll see you guys on the one. Take care. Be safe.